my microphone out. <laughs> <laughs> It's so great to see everyone. Let's give a uh, big Al a round of applause and then the other big Al a round of applause. <laughs> On the way here, I, I got the same smell that we're all smelling right now. Oh, oh yeah. The toughest thing about hanging out with you all right now is that we all want to eat. We all want to eat that freedom dividend. How yeah. many of you all have seen me uh, speak before? It seems like most of you. Fun. Oh, oh wow, so curious. Oh, fantastic. Things are going so well in this state for us. How many of y'all were at the office opening earlier today in the morning? Oh, wow. Like 100 people for the opening of that office. It was so much fun. Crowd surfing almost broke out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been the pattern. I've been coming to Iowa at least once a month for 17 months, 18 months. And every time we come back, the enthusiasm is higher, the crowds are bigger, the chants are louder, the food is tastier. Mainly because it's afford food now. <laughs> uh, the energy is just climbing and climbing. We are one of only two campaigns in the whole race that has been growing this whole time. And right now, I believe I'm sixth in the national polls. <laughs> Special shout out to those of you who've been with this campaign from the beginning. Raise your hand if you were Yang Yang, like OG, uh, let's call it uh, 2018. Yeah, I, call it, I know. So hopefully you're enjoying this ride as well. That you've all had that experience where you were like, yo, check out Andrew Yang. You sent some videos, sent interviews, and then you didn't hear back. And then six weeks later, you heard back, right? <laughs> they were like, hey, I saw him on uh, CNN. I listened to this podcast, and then I checked him out, and then you get curious. We have this whole seven stages of Yang. <laughs> I have a feeling most of you are in the later stages, and there is no cure. Am I right, Yang Yang? Yeah! Yeah! This is the stages you want to be on. This is the stage where you start seeing what's possible, the magic. And I love being here in Iowa so much because you all control the future of the country. That's why so many presidential candidates just keep on beating down your door. You're a little bit spoiled. You're a little, you're a little bit like, I don't know about that guy. I only met him the one time. <laughs> but you know what to do with your power, your responsibility more than anyone else in the country. Now, when I'm here in Iowa, people will tell me flat out, so they're not comparing me to the candidates of this cycle. They're comparing me to Barack Obama. They're comparing me to other people that have been here and become president of the United States. That's the perspective you have, and you have to use that power to the betterment of the country. What is the vision we have to take to the rest of the country as quickly as possible? You all know if you're here today that my flagship proposal is a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month. What do you think about that? Woo! And the first time you heard it, I know you thought it was too good to be true. You thought it was a gimmick. You might even have thought it was a joke. But then if you start spending time with the campaign, you realize that this is a deeply American idea. Thomas Paine was for it, Martin Luther King was for it, and one state has had it for almost 40 years. And what state is that, Iowa? Alaska! And how do they pay for it? Oil! And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology! That's right, instead of just having Amazon soaking up $20 billion out and you seeing zero, we're going to get you that money. Yeah. And then we get you that money, we build a trickle-up economy. Some of it floats back up to Amazon and the gang, but most of it stays right here in Iowa. It makes you stronger, healthier, mentally healthier, gives your kids a real chance to learn. This is the trickle-up economy. This, unlike everything else people are talking about, would work. And this would also help reverse the depletion of rural areas in Iowa and around the country. Because you know right now, rural areas are getting sucked dry. You're automating away the jobs that were on the farms. The family farms are getting bought out by conglomerates. The people who are set to inherit the family farms in some cases do not want to take over that business. And so you wind up with this phenomenon that has helped get Donald Trump into the Oval Office. That you have many people around this country who don't, do not feel like they're included in our shared progress. They feel like their path forward is shaky. They think that their kids' future is darker than the life they experienced. And I understand the feeling that Americans have that their kids' future is going to be tougher than the lives they had is correct by the numbers. 
If you were born in the 1940s in the United States, there's a 93% chance you were going to do better than your parents. That's the American dream. That's what we grew up with. If you were born in the 1990s, which describes some people here in this room, your chances of doing better than your parents, 50-50. And that set of odds is unfortunately getting worse, not better. If that is the situation we're in, then Americans will be subject to some really bad leadership and some really bad ideas. It's in your hands, the people of Iowa, to take a different story and a different set of solutions to the rest of America. What the rest of America seems like magic here in Iowa, it's in your hands. How many of you all caucused at the last caucus 2016? Oh, look at that. I love it. Those of you who don't have your hands up, you can at least lie and just pretend you did. <laughs> <laughs> it does not take that many Iowans to completely change the direction of this country. I want you all to visualize with me, in February of 2020, it's going to be colder, <laughs> but in February of 2020, the world's attention and the world's headlines will come here to Iowa. And imagine that headline when they see that Andrew Yang finished top one, top two, or top three in Iowa. Yeah. Imagine those headlines yeah. around the world. Yeah. What will the talking heads say then? Yeah. Be like, how did this happen? Andrew Yang beat who? John Yang. He's still not wearing a tie. I definitely beat John Yang. <laughs> And then that story then sweeps the country and the rest of America goes, wait a minute, we can do that? We can vote for that guy? We can actually do the things that he says? Like, it's not impossible? And then we go to New Hampshire, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of New Hampshire fun. What's the third party in New Hampshire? Libertarians, that's Aww. right. And what do you think the Libertarians think of the Freedom Dividend? They love it. They love it. It's essentially named after them. <laughs> And New Hampshire is also what's called an open primary, which means if you're a Republican or an Independent, you can actually participate in the Democratic primary in the state of New Hampshire. So what do you think the Republicans in New Hampshire are going to do? Do you think they're going to help Donald Trump stop William Weld, which is kind of dull and boring? <laughs> they're going to come over and be like, you know what, I'm actually going to go in on Yang. And so the polling that happens in New Hampshire, what do they do? They check on registered Democrats that's gonna underestimate libertarian, independent, and even Republican support that's all gonna come right here. So after we put a strong showing up in Iowa, we go to New Hampshire, we can shock everyone in New Hampshire. Yes. This is the, the, the way the revolution happens. It's beautiful. It's very, very achievable. Right now, what is the number one criteria that Democratic primary voters have for the nominee? Beating Beat Trump. 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 Beating Donald Trump, that's right. And there are only two candidates in the entire field that 10% of Donald Trump voters said that they will support as a nominee, and you're looking at one of them. Yeah. What that means is that when I am the nominee, we will win. Yeah. Yeah. That's just the math. If you get 10% of Donald Trump voters on your side, and you know the Democrats and progressives are going to be like, well, heck, <laughs> you know, we got to get that, we got to get Trump out. We win, we take the whole thing. One of the reasons why Joe Biden's lead is so resilient is because people see him as the surest bet to beat Donald Trump in 2020. And when they realize that there's another sure bet in the field, you're going to see our support grow and grow and grow. So this is the vision, but we need your help here in Iowa. So those of you who didn't have your, raise your hand if you've never caucused before. All right, so we need you all to figure out how to caucus where you live. It's not, it's not that easy, it's not that hard. It's somewhere in between easy and hard. <laughs> but it does require a little bit of time and attention and legwork to figure out where the caucus location is and uh, what paperwork you need to fill out to make it happen. So we need you to do that. And then we need, raise your hand if you've already caucused uh, before and you pretty much know the story of how to caucus. So uh, what we need you to do is explain to the other people how to do it. <laughs> but number two, we need you all to keep on sending Yang Yang stuff to your friends and neighbors and then try and get a few of them in on it. We don't need that many Iowans. If we build this organization and this cause to a point where we get tens of thousands of Iowans, and that is what we need to shock the world. I'm going from here, I'm going to New Hampshire next week. I can guarantee you, if 
Iowa does its job, New Hampshire is going to do its job. Because we, we can take this whole state. Yeah. yeah! Anyone who doesn't think we can win is not paying any attention. Yeah, that's right. The last poll I saw, do you know how many people have actually decided who they're voting for uh, in 2020 on the Democratic side? 9%. 9%, 91% are undecided. You talk to most Iowans, they're, they're at the same point. They're like looking at a couple people, but they're totally up in the air. Anyone who says they know what's gonna happen next year is full of shit. That's <laughs> 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 laughing, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> then they're very wise, very precious. <laughs> But the joy of being here in Iowa is that it, it, this is where democracy actually works the way it's intended. You go to the rest of the country and everyone is despaired, uh, is filled with despair and has given up. Because they think that their votes don't matter, that our government's just overrun by corporate interests and, and all the money. That the pipes are clogged with millions of dollars. They're right. The pipes are clogged with millions of dollars. Their votes generally do not matter. But here in Iowa, it's the reverse. Each Iowan's worth about a thousand Californians. How many people are here in this room today? Well over the 98 best. <laughs> <laughs> what's that, what's that exactly? 98 people are in this room. <laughs> so that means there are 98,000 Californians. That's like 40 football stadiums worth of Californians. Do you see the math, Iowa? That is why we all keep on coming, is because each of you is worth your weight in gold. And you know what that means? Your neighbors are worth their weight in gold. Your friends are worth their weight in gold. You get one Iowa to caucus for Andrew Yang in addition to yourself, that's enormous. We do that enough times, we can rewrite the rules of this society to work for us. And there is no other way for it to happen except for us to make this happen. There's no other way. If you were waiting for DC to figure its shit out and solve these problems, we're going to be waiting forever to the detriment of our kids and the people that we're trying to set up for success. So this is our time, this is our calling, and are we gonna listen to it? Are we gonna do this in February of 2020? Yeah! yeah! It's your time, Iowa. You're gonna send the message up, you're gonna raise the flag, and the entire country is going to follow your lead because it's not left, it's not right, it's, it's forward! Right. of criminalizing marijuana in a lot of the country, uh, we're putting a lot of people in jail for crimes that are not even crimes in other parts of the country. We know that most of the people we're putting in jail and prosecuting are people of color, because that's just the way our system works. And we also know that marijuana is a safer means of pain relief for many people with various conditions than, for example, hyper-addictive opiates that are causing uh, massive deaths uh, around the country. And so to me, legalizing marijuana is the right thing to do, I would actually go even a step further and legalize opiates for personal use. Because right now there are many people who are struggling with addiction that don't seek help because they're afraid they're gonna to go to a prison cell uh, because what they're using is illegal. But if you look at the genesis of the drug epidemic in this country, there was one point when there were more opiate prescriptions in the state of Ohio than there were humans in the state of Ohio. Yeah. Now why is that? 
because Purdue Pharma realized it could make tens of billions of dollars by dispensing OxyContin prescriptions and saying it's a wonder drug that's not addictive. Turns out it was wildly addictive. They paid a $600 million fine, which sounds like a lot until you realize they made $30 billion. They paid, they paid a 2% fine. And they killed thousands of Americans. So if that's the genesis of it, then you have to own up to it as a government and say, hey, we were asleep at the switch. We let these companies prey on our people, make billions of dollars, kill thousands of Americans. And so the last thing you want to do is then criminalize the people who are struggling with addiction, because many of them went from OxyContin to heroin to fentanyl, uh, because heroin and fentanyl are, in many cases, cheaper and easier to get a hold of than Oxy at this point. So we have to, in my view, if you look at what other countries have done, we've decriminalized opiates for personal use in other parts of the world. And you've seen drug overdose rates go down. You've seen substance abuse rates go down. So to me, marijuana is in some ways like the least of our problems. I would legalize it, and I would go a step further. I would pardon everyone who's in jail for a nonviolent marijuana-related offense on April 20th, 2021. <laughs> Like, wow, things sure did change while I was in jail. <laughs> now there's the Asian president high five me, being like, you're out. <laughs> I gotta say, if, if, if when I'm president, why would you use the pardon power on these, frankly, like these rich weirdos that tend to get pardoned? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you look at who actually gets pardoned, it's always some rich weirdo. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I would pardon someone that no one has ever heard of <laughs> that is in jail because our system has become undu unduly punitive towards things that uh, are not considered crimes in a lot of the country. I can project. Um, we need to find a woman. I think it's this one. Hi, how are you there? So if you were to recommend, besides your book, <laughs> Books that you would recommend people that have impacted you. What would they be? Uh, like in what continent area? <laughs> um, so like, I mean, you can whatever. Like, what are some great books that you've read that you think like Americans or anyone? Wow, so fun. <laughs> so just give me the fiction or nonfiction. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> one, one fiction, one nonfiction. Sure. Um, my, one of my favorite novelists is a guy named Haruki Murakami, who writes both uh, yes. and nonfiction. Uh, but I find his novels to be really uh, positive, escapist. Uh, so Wind Up Bird Chronicle. Uh, Nor Norwegian Wood uh, was something like that I enjoyed a great deal. But I, I'm a big Murakami fan on the fiction side. Though he has written nonfiction as well. Um, on the nonfiction side, uh, this is gonna sound, this is gonna nerd out a little bit, but I, I read a book called AI Superpowers that impacted me and it, it talks about the future of AI development with the US and China. And I thought that it was a useful perspective on the future. Um, yeah, so those two books uh, enjoyed. There are many others I like to read. Andrew Yang can read. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. If you could change the debate process, what would you do? If you were a moderator, if you had the chance, if you became president or a further leader in the Democratic Party, how would you change the debate structure? Uh, so our, our current debate structure is essentially not a debate. Uh, what it is is a distributed media appearance um, across a set of candidates. And so if I were to want to change that, what I would do is I would sit candidates down in a different format, and I'd probably make it asynchronous in the sense that it's not like, hey, you're all here and then we stick this thing in your face. Because TV as a medium has certain limitations. Uh, and you wind up really, and like, I, you know, you also see me comment on it. But I have to say, and I'm gonna do this, as a normal human being, uh, being in that process is so weird. Because you're like talking to people like they're humans, but backstage. And then um, you see them walking around and they're reciting lines. Like, uh, which, you know, which is like, remind me, I was in a high school play as a kid. And I was like, it's like my high school play. <laughs> because you know, like people backstage being like, you know, like, I don't know where I had their lines and whatnot. I was like, no, 
wow, it's happening right now. <laughs> it's, like an, it's like an episode of Who Will Run Our Country. <laughs> and it is, and it, it's mildly horrifying, but it is one reason why you wind up with Donald Trump as your president. And then now, now I'm like adapting, where I'm like, okay, I guess I will try and take part in like this like media exercise. <laughs> you know? You so, were great on firing line, though. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I was up all night, so. <laughs> no, no, no. so you're really good on firing. You're fired down Trump. So, so the way that I would, so the way I would modify the process is, is I would have asynchronous sit downs with candidates, and then I would uh, ask them a series of questions, and then you essentially can like pick and choose the candidates, being like, if we get uh, like the same questions, then you can see how each of them answers that question, and then you can just uh, like experience it in your own time, your own schedule, instead of having it all be in like a two or three hour block. And then there would be some like free form being like, hey, talk about whatever you want for like this period, uh, and then you'd have a sense as to each individual's, and then what would take me to the next level is like, what resources would you direct us to? And then in my case, I'd try to direct you to various studies and like facts and, and things like that that would help drive it. The, the problem really is the TV medium in real time um, because you wind up with people who have to try and like scrunch our politics into the medium. Um, and that, I, in a way, I don't fault them because, uh, you know, it's like, you're a TV producer. It's like, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna try and produce TV that, that you know, Americans will actually watch, which means if you talk for more than 75 seconds, we will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? How do you maintain your, like, you wanna play by the rules within the debate, but no one's playing by those rules, so how do you get past that within the debate structure as you're in the Well, the, the, the fun thing about it is that uh, the impact we've had in the debates has not been related to the, the time. Um, so we've raised more than other candidates, I believe, for the last two debates in a row. We raised a million dollars. Like, in a I will say I'm really excited about this next debate, um, in part because two of the three moderators I know and am friendly with, and they will give us a very, very fair shake. There's also a chance that the field is going to go to um, two nights, and so then if you do the math if you only have five or six candidates and <laughs> you know, get more air time. Um, so I think this next debate will be very good for us on that level. The biggest thing we have to keep doing though is we have to keep on qualifying as the field shrinks, yep. uh, which is where you all come in. We got your back. Uh, because, well, you know, like, because uh, the, the fact is, like most Americans are not as, uh, are not as uh, uh, honed in as you are, so they just turn on the TV and be like, who's running for president? And then they'll be like, you know, that stage and that's it. So if I'm still on the stage when it's like six or seven, then I'll be like, wow, like, let me listen to that guy. And, and then uh, they'll see that I'm, I'm a real contender. Uh, so those are some of the things that we need to do. This, the system is imperfect, for sure. Um, we're doing great within the system in our own way, in part because Americans are so sick of the system. <laughs> it's really, it's so meta, it's so interesting. <laughs> but I, I'm actually somewhat confident that when Americans see me, even in that setting, they actually understand uh, who I am and what I'm trying to do. And many people realize that I'm essentially like a normal person, a civilian, uh, who just happens to be on the stage wearing makeup. Um, you know, I hope that's the vibe they get. I think, I think that it, it's coming through. Uh, in, so the media blackout is fading, where I'm gonna be on Rachel Maddow this week, which is very exciting. Woo, woo, woo. Uh, we've got a, I'm gonna be back on The View with Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> uh, and my wife's going to make her public debut um, over the next number. And if you think I'm badass, wait until you see her. <laughs> Yeah, she's the next level. People will be like, forget about Andrew. <laughs> Let's make him the first gentleman. <laughs> Let's switch places. Yeah. Selfie time. Selfie Is it selfie time? time? Selfie well, time. Thank you, Abel. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're gonna have Andrew standing here by the front. So, as you leave, you'll be able to stop and get a selfie or an autograph with Andrew Yang. 
So please try to make a semi-normal line this way. And uh, we'd love to make sure that all of you get a chance to say hi to Andrew. Everybody, please have your ow. <laughs> please have your phones up and ready, guys. Are you okay? <laughs> please have your phones up and ready. Please have your phones up and please, one more time, thank our host, Big Ow. Thank you.